right. So we are recording now, everybody. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Office of the Secretary uh, Black History Month program, looking at showmobiles in Washington, D.C., and how they have contributed to the story of Black people in the arts. As you know, the national theme for Black History Month this year is African-Americans in the arts. And so this great conversation with Dr. Felicia Garland Jackson is going to discuss showmobiles and their role in supporting the arts in the community. And so I would like to start by introducing our Secretary of State for Washington, D.C., Kimberly Bassett. Thank you, um, Dr. Lopez. Thank you for all the incredible work that you're doing. This is so exciting. Um, we sent out this um, invitation to several people in the community, and we got so much feedback. People were saying, oh, I remember um, the showmobile. Oh, I remember we took the showmobile on the road. So we've heard all these really great stories. And I was so excited when um, Dr. Garland Jackson approached um, Dr. Lopez about this and all the important research that she's done. Um, I thought it would be fitting to make sure that our representatives from um, Department of Parks and Rec were here. And so we wanna thank Director Gina Toppin for being here and any other people on the call from the Department of Parks and Rec. Um, Right now, the city, as you all know, you know, we've had some issues around safety and, you know, and we've been focusing on the youth and trying to figure out ways that we can engage them in a positive way and to learn about the showmobile and its impact um, it had at that time. And now to com in comparison to all the important work that um, um Direct director um, Feeney is doing and director Toppin. Um, it's just incredible. So thank you all for joining. Let's um, let's get busy. I don't know if um, Dr. Matthews would, has anyone else that would you would like to speak, but um, I think Dr. Top, I mean Director Toppin, if you'd like to say a word, that few words, that would be great. And again, thank you for supporting us. We're gonna have these throughout the year. Um, we did last year. I also want to acknowledge all of our commission members. We have in my office three commissions, the Martin Luther King Commission, the Emancipation Day Commission, and we also recently um, picked up the Juneteenth Commission. So we are looking for new commissioners. So if anybody's interested, please don't hesitate to, um, to ping me or do Dr. Lopez. It's Kimberly.Bassett at DC.gov. And also follow the Office of the Secretary on all social platforms and um, the department OPR, which is um, the Office of um, Public Records. Thank you. Uh, I always call it all kinds of things because these are state archivists and I'm sorry. But yes, look at us on Twitter, all the social media platforms. And I want to thank you all. Gina, I mean, Director Toppin. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, I'm Gina Toppin, and I'm actually, I was the deputy director before, but I transitioned over to the chief of staff role now. So I oh. um, have a, a full scale knowledge of, of, of all the uh, entities and the, the magic that is DPR. And so I'm thankful that you all asked me to join this call. As uh, uh, Madam Secretary mentioned, you know, just it's important and critical that we have recreational, meaningful recreational activities for the youth and for families and, and everyone in the city. And so I'm personally interested in learning more about the history of the showmobiles. So I'm going to learn some new things today. So thank you. Thank you. Now you have more responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. So I guess uh, I'm gonna go right in. We only have hours, so I'm gonna go right in to Dr. Garland Jackson. And <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. And so, so I guess, oh yeah. I'd like to thank you for having me. And I'd <laughs> like to give you some props, Dr. Matthews, in that he found me by doing his homework. 
So he's busily working in the office to make sure that you have uh, representation for Black History Month in the um, arts field. So kudos to you for finding me buried in probably a bunch of reports nobody ever reads. So <laughs> kudos to you. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to read your bio, if you don't mind. So Dr. Felicia Garland Jackson, earned both her sociology PhD and her MA in interdisciplinary studies from George Mason University. Her research focuses primarily on the intersection of institutions and inequalities with further research into military family sociology. Dr. Garland Jackson's doctoral research funded through a grant from the National Park Service investigated the agency's Washington deep sea based summer in the park program. This innovative federal effort designed to bring the area's African American residents into the local national parks for free structured activities reflected the local and national social forces of the era. Launched in the shadow of the April 1968 riots, SITP, as the program was called, events brought together the fractured community through a series of art, music, and recreational events. The research project culturally documented African-American program participants, post-riot memories of the city, as well as their SITP experiences. And so thank you for joining us, Dr. Garland Jackson. Thanks for having me. And so my first question to you is, what led to the creation of the Summer in the Parks program? So it's really interesting. And to get a nerd like me in to talk about research, you may need to reel me back because that answer might be an hour long. So what's interesting, and this is great because there's a lot of misperceptions about summer in the parks. There's a, a school of thought that it was started immediately after the riots to bring people into the parks to so they wouldn't continue to riot. Um, and you know the chaos and whatnot. But in actuality, the planning for Summer of the Parks, because we all know government work, started well before. So it was originally smaller scoped to be able to build some free structured activities um, to sort of supplement. And we think of, think of the great society back then, right? And that effort to build cultural and bring sort of the national parks to the people. Um, so it had been started at a smaller scale, smaller budget, smaller everything to be in, you know, in DC doing a little bit more outside of the footprint of the National Park Service at the time. But what happened is it blew up in budget, in scope, in purpose, in, in timeline to start in July of 1968. So it was this little idea that had been working sort of as a little pet project. And then it became wider scoped that it's not only DC, but also reaching out to Catoctin and down to Richmond and, and the national capital region as a whole. So that's really how it started, a little good idea fairy that turned into this uh, the budget was about $2 million, and imagine that in 1967-68 funding. So anyway, that's a little bit about a, the background of how it started. And that was not a small chunk of change for 1968. Um, right. How was it received? Because I know that in the shadow of the riots, you know, D.C. was pretty badly burned, and there's a lot of anger. We have a report in the Office of Public Records of a series of city council hearings where people were discussing why they were so angry, what they wanted out of the city, how they felt like they didn't really have anything. And so what was the reception to, excuse me, summer in the parks by the local community? So from our interviews, it depends, and it depends on perspective. There's people that feel a certain way about the federal government, right? There's people that were upset because of, you know, Georgetown being sort of armed guards so no one could get in there and riot. 
sort of letting it burn. People were in shock um, from our interviews where it was like, uh, you know, this is our own community. This happened. So I think in the shadow of that, everyone approached it differently. Some people were still angry with, hey, we've got all of this damage and you are worried about teaching people how to do archery or go camping in Greenbelt overnight or enjoying sort of the learning more in outdoor recreation and, and those types of activities and the music. Um so it was sort of putting a Band-Aid on a bigger problem. So people came from all different perspectives, but there was a huge embrace to it because it was, and I'm not even going to say a distraction, but sort of a reminder in that the opportunities for community cohesion and to get together for concerts and to give the kids something to do, you know, at their local school or their little park led or some kinds of activities, or the showmobiles, which are awesome, rolling into a neighborhood, unloading, and you get some quality musicians bringing it to the people, reminding them sort of of that unity and that shared purpose, and culturally how DC was so vibrant. I mean, I think that it was cathartic in many ways, and provided some terrific opportunities to sort of remind people of, you know, the greater purpose. And it was, you know, big black power back then too, right? So being like, this is our home, we're going to sort of regroup and we're going to, you know, to move through this. So there was a lot of power that came out of it. And so it was so well received. Um, that it was sort of great idea that actually came to life. We know good ideas go to die in places or they're starved of funding, which would happen to this eventually. But for that moment in time, you know, terrific programming. You know, it really makes me think of um, during the Great Depression when government supported culture because they said they didn't want the culture to disappear because of the larger societal issues that were happening. Everyone was focused on the depression and the effects of the depression. So they said, you know, we're going to put some money behind these cultural programs, the Federal Writers Project and things like that to sustain our culture and support it. And you hinted at it about how showmobiles became a part of this program. But could you go a little more in depth about how the showmobiles came? I will. Well, first, we don't want to forget that so much of summer in the parks is about local community. So think of it as the people who were hired for summer from the local community, those teenagers, you know, Wilson High School, I think it is, sent a lot of people and it was so-and-so no so-and-so and they get a good job for the summer working in the community and stayed to be rangers their whole career. Fantastic for representation. Um, some of the folks in the showmobiles who were musicians got their start with a, with a showmobile job and they're playing for local community. They're building that because we know live music is special, right? And so taking that out to the kids who are inspired where music and sort of ethnomusicology becomes part of their experience. So the opportunities for the local kids, those local musicians, some went on to become, have a huge platform. So it's just, I'm so excited to be able to talk about it today because it sends me back into that experience of interviewing these musicians who were like, that opened the door for me. And I not only played locally, but I played internationally due to getting my start on the showmobile. So it's being woven into the local community as a, a vehicle, pun intended, to you know launch the love of music and the love of local community and access. You really can't forget about access because there was a Parks to the People, Mission 66, which is 1966 campaign where the national parks focused so much on Western parks, right? Grand Canyon and Yosemite and yeah, whatever, we're we might not ever get there, 
but remembering our our city parks, our urban parks, right? And that those are a feature and we own those parks because we are taxpayers. So focusing on that was phenomenal. And this was part of it. Show mobiles to the people, not take yourself somewhere for a concert. We're going to roll up in your neighborhood and we are going to start playing music. We're going to get some hot dogs. We're going to get some ice cream and we are going to make sure that's available to everyone. So that is a little more about the show mobiles and because it's all part of that higher mission of the National Park Service back in the great, you know, great society parks to the people. So how yeah. does the how does the Department of Parks and Recreation become a part of this? So so there's some things that I love and realize I'm more of the scholar in the end of the National Park Service, but I do know about the D.C. sort of warm handoff, if you will. So part of Summer in the Parks that's neat about this project with so many things is you have a federal agency who is doing things where they're not really being recognized fully for what they're doing. When we interviewed folks, they would be going to their local school or the parklet or a, a bigger park that were, you know, DC parks and federal agency, but we got to think about the timeline. That was before DC parks and rec had its reach that it has today, right? So those were federal entities. So in the handoff of sort of home rule type era that the park service handed off showmobiles to DC parks and rec. So there was sort of this seamless transition where people didn't know that was necessarily the Park Service. They recognized DC Parks and Rec, but it's the continuity of the service of the showmobiles. So people would have consistent access, whether through the Park Service, through DC Parks and Recs, but the owners of the program and the funding and all those things were, I want to, I want to put a little bookmark here, was not the most important thing at the time. Hello. It was about getting to the people. And so that's how DC Parks and Rec, you see it in community gardens. You see it in the actual parks. Showmobiles were one of the warm handoffs where it came from the federal government over to local government. And you all continued that in sort of a seamless transition for the people. No, and it really was an example of what that first generation of DC government local leaders wanted to accomplish. They wanted to build this government that supported the people and served the people. That was a lot of, especially you see that in the speeches of Marion Barry, a lot of talking about, okay, this is a government of the people. It's supposed to support the people. It's supposed to serve the people. And so this program sort of fits right neatly into the mission of the early leaders of DC government. And it's kind of carried on even to today with that same mission of, you know, our motto now is we are DC and <clears throat> supporting the local people. And so one of the things that we spoke about earlier was the benefit of having these showmobiles in the community and that it's the local government actually supporting this. And so what would you say was the long lasting benefit of these programs? So what's really interesting is right now I work in primary prevention and primary prevention is about stopping harmful behavior before it starts, right? So in building these, what's called protective factors, and I'm not gonna nerd out on you completely, but protective factors are cohesion, sense of belonging, some of there were um, commute, there were garden like the green machine was an activity um, where they would do gardens with kids and and teach them about you know vegetables and and actually plant things and go out to Oxen Hill and see the farm animals and just all these things that build knowledge in kids and give them a sense of adventure and. So parts of summer in the parks were not only directed at kids, but imagine that 
um, Summer in the Parks point being the concert series that you may or may not have growing up, but the, those types of experiences of that you, that cohesion within the community, those are all things that help people avoid feeling isolated and, and having passions. We interviewed folks who as kids went camping and they're still into outdoor activities today. Kids would ride their bikes in little gangs to get to the showmobile and they're still riding their bike out in the parks today. So building in these healthy, positive behaviors, whether it's an interest in art or music or still going to see live music, which is vibrant in DC, these things are all really good for a sense of well-being. So planting those seeds in the community then not only was cathartic in the shadow of the riots, but to build them into adulthood, build them into families. We had people who would show us our pay, their paychecks from way back early 70s, right? And to explain that it took a quarter to get over and people would be following what's going on this weekend in live music, what's going on, or putting their kids on a bus to the McCormick Spice Factory on a surprise field trip, and how this contributed to their childhood. So there's so many things built into Summer in the Parks that you all continue at DC Parks and Rec that are so good for well-being in so many areas that we don't have enough time today to even go into all of them, but know that they're positive factors that contribute to well-being even today. So, and that nostalgia, because for so many people interviewing them, it was literally the best time of their life. Best time, best time ever. Free concerts. The original Summer in the Park concert was Cab Calloway and Pearl Bailey. So they weren't kidding around the ability to go watch that for free and wear your Sunday finest um, was fantastic. Oh, there's a hand up. Secretary Bassett has a hand up. Yes. Did you mean to raise your hand? Maybe. Sorry, no. guys. Oh. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Hey, I was, say, I was trying to do a hand clap. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, or maybe hey, we need this on the <laughs> team. <laughs> but you know, that's something, what you said is something that is actually very important. Um, you mentioned primary prevention. And that's something that stood out to me when I was reading about, reading your report about the summer in the parks and I read about the showmobiles is the positive impact that it has on the community. And you talked about it, you know, in your interviews. And I was going to say, what is one thing that stands out to you from your interviews that really sort of encapsulates the importance of this project? So one of my favorite, favorite interviews, and I did it at Oxton Hill, and it was a uh, an adult who had been a kid participating. And you really have to visualize this story. But he lived over by Fort DuPont, sort of Fort Circles. And he, his parents were, um, you, you know, in the midst of divorcing. And it was just a really chaotic environment. And he would go sit as a little kid on the front porch. And this is back in the day where it takes a village to raise a child. Like you could wander off in the morning and not come home till the lights come on, right? So he would sit out and I imagine he's, you know, on his front porch by himself. And and he was explaining to me that in as he sat on the front porch, he'd all of a sudden hear the showmobile music. And it would be amazing to him in lifting his spirits and he'd get on his little bike and he'd just roll out and he, they would be there all day. So he talked about, you know, the hot dogs and the, the ice cream and sometimes they'd have this and, and just engaging in the music and the activities because what's so exciting is that the people on the showmobiles weren't just musicians and those people that work summer in the parks were from the local community. So in recognizing, like engaging those little kids that would show up maybe alone on their bike. And it really transported him out of a 
it, it, you know, a chaotic home environment to getting this warm embrace and you're safe and you're fed and you're nurtured with the music and how that not only did, does he ride his bike today, hello, over the local area, but in really helping him out in that moment in his childhood that could have been if he were isolated, really what drew him out of the house. And that's where, you know, your neighbors are watching you and, and you're, you know, in that sort of enveloped in that environment and how it helped him. Whereas we see often kids can get off track and go into, you know, negative behaviors. So it was, and he was sort of teary about it in what it meant to him. And that's one of a million great stories, but some funny ones and how city kids are going out to Catoctin and camping. And it was like, Ooh, you know, what is that? <laughs> um, and what I love from it is being a student of African Americans and recreation and engaging in outdoor spaces. This whole thing started out for me as, you know, with the Olympics and, and black folks don't swim. And I thought, I know a lot of black folks that swim. I'm a black folk that swims. Hello. So where is this from? And how do we engage nature? How do we get those benefits of well-being sort of competing with this you know, narrative that we don't camp and we don't swim and we don't hike and we're not getting the benefits of nature. So that in me was my personal inspiration of going on this journey is how do we reframe that narrative so we get the benefits of, you know, in the data from outdoor engagement and things like that. So that's a very long answer to your very short question. No, it was it was great because you know it really got to what I was thinking in that you know we hear so much of the negative that's happening, so much of young people turning to violence and turning to stealing and turning to all of these negative things, but you rarely hear about stories like you just told where oh this program helped me, this program supported me, you know, and you see the programs, you see the flyers, you see the tweets, and you see the advertisements, but you never hear about the personal stories of the people who are impacted by these programs and how it helps them and how it supports them. And I really think that learning, particularly the personal story, helps people to understand the positive impact of these programs and then gives ammunition to say, we should support these programs, we should fund these programs. Mm -hmm. And they should continue, because I know you mentioned that the funding did dry up for the program. Well, yes, but one thing I want to mention back to showmobiles in this handoff is the park service, you know, it gets a little messy. It gets a little messy back back in the day where who's funding what in this turnover and park service continuing to fund as D.C. took over showmobiles funding the musicians, what that looked like. Because it just imagine it was all sort of um, in flux at the time. So there was sort of the natural, I'd call it natural, you know, who pays for what and how do we do this and how do you divide? But for the Summer in the Parks program is, you know, it's a, a change in priority and a change in direction, which at the time of its uh, original iteration, it was about cultural enrichment, you know, providing entertainment, yet still caring about well-being and developing a sense of cohesion. Um, and as priorities change, which we see all the time in the government, that it became less and less of a priority also look at the timing. You've got the bicentennial going on, which is going to, you know, suck all the energy and the money out of the room. So a lot of things contributed. And what I found in this research is that a lot of people claim that they set up summer in the parks. A lot of people claim um, that they were, you know, instrumental. And there were a lot of people who were active in setting it up and running it. And there's a lot of different theories about why it was stood down. It was sort of um, starved to death 
honestly, the original iteration and cut back, cut back, cut back until you've got some legacy programs, which would be your concerts, big concert series. DuPont ran it a long time um, where you would bring in, you know, A-list folks. So change in priorities, change in funders, appropriators, right? Change in perspective. Why should we be paying for this thing that is in this little part of the country when we're supposed to fund the whole country, right? Different changes in attitudes. So anyway, it was power. The original iteration was power. So it lived in certain iterations, follow on iterations in certain ways. Good example, Fort DuPont, amazing, amazing, because they even had like a little daycare center, which might have been off the books. I think the statute of limitations might be expired, hopefully, but they had this little program where parents would bring water and snacks and whatever, sort of run by the park. Um, so everybody was like in their own little fiefdom of what they did and what they could continue under their own funding. You know, that's a good, you know, that's a good point. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that we need to remember is priority shift. You know, that cultural programs, cultural arts programs are important and they do still need funding and they do still need support in the face of these larger issues, you know, that we sure. shouldn't lose sight of the importance of these programs as a cultural institution. <laughs> well, and that was the that was one of the recommendations. We actually went in and we compared because they had some 1965 data, I believe on poverty, chronic poverty, kids per household, etc., sort of tying it into, you know, after school and what you do in the summer. Um being justification of doing this in the first place, and we did some studying in the census um the American Community Survey of the pockets of poverty that still exist, kids that still need after school programming in this cultural space. Um, and that was the recommendation to the Park Service, because remember, I'm not Park Service. I'm George Mason University in this capacity today, so I could speak freely, is that was the recommendation is fund these things. You know, the, the pools and the roller skating all of those things that they used to fund, there's still a need in the local community for structured funded activities from you all locally and the wider park service. Now, I don't want to take up all the air in the room, and I know we have people in the audience who may have questions for you. So if anyone has a sure. question, please raise your hand and I'll give you the power to speak and chat with us. And I'll give it a moment. And if not, I'll keep going. <laughs> okay. No. Nope. Oh, okay. Gina. So okay. I don't have any any questions, but I just uh, did want to to note that it's it's really um, great that the importance of access for um, with the showmobile is still uh, very prevalent in everything that DPR does. Our roving leaders um, who are instrumental in, in violence intervention and, and disruption um, and, and, and uh, violence interrupters and uh, in, in their roles in the communities and the showmobile within DPR is a it's just a hit everywhere we go. You know, we have uh, over 68 recreation centers across the district, um, but we can't, and even though every recreation center is within a mile of, of, of a home, we can't be everywhere. And so um, the showmobile really fills in those, those little gaps um, and, and brings even more fun and joy. So the, the joy that you say that uh, others have felt from and memories, fond memories that they have of the showmobile are still very prevalent today. We've actually even added a what we call a um, the big show, which is a movie, uh, a movie screen. 
so that travels and does movies outside um, our recreation centers and different areas of the city. So um, we call that the big show. And so we love we love that. So I'm just this is just awesome that, you know, the same um, intent of the showmobile is still alive and thriving um, within DPR. And it's just one of our biggest hits. I love that. I love it. And one thing, and I see that we have another hand, but one comment is interviewing people who drove this showmobile, if you can imagine, and having kids running alongside it, um, which must have been like the most joyful experience. So it's one of those where, you know, that's amazing for the kids. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? And then for the driver to know, because remember, they were from the local community of that shared positive vibes, if you will, in, in just that experience. So yes, it was popular back then and it sounds fantastic. I love the big show. We'll have to come see the big show. Definitely. Now our next hand is Emily Welsh. Hello, hello. Hi, hi there. Hey. Thank you so, so much for your talk. Um, this has been really, really fascinating and uh, as a DC transplant, I did not really know a lot of this. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, because I'm over at the National Cathedral, how can we here and in other, you know, non-DC government um, organizations help to promote the kind of work that you are doing while we are also working on our own history uh, at the Cathedral of Racial Injustice and Reconciliation? What can we do to help really promote the work that you are doing, this very, very important research and really important presentation to kind of work within our own, and you don't have to answer our own questions because we're struggling enough with that right now. Um, but how can we help to promote what you are doing as, as part of our, both our big church as the National Cathedral and our small church as a congregation initiative? So I think that's for me, and yes. I'm going to really defer a little bit because our project that we did for the National Park Service um, is, a, you know, we've done a report, 275 mm -hmm. pages of fun in, in Nerdland, that's me, but we, in continuing that message um, and how that it's captured and put out by the Park Service is really not me. I'm, I'm the researcher yeah. that did the the research, but I'm sure the, you know, the, the folks from um, Parks and Rec, as mm -hmm. far as Black History Month and continuing this journey, might have more input on how they, this event today is definitely part of maybe the start of how we wrap around, but I know the Parks and Rec has a robust, uh, where they keep their own history of, of these things. So if you, I turn that over to to DC folks on that one. Okay. Oh, also, I don't know if anyone heard it, but on WTOP the other day, there was a um, quick, like Matt Koufax story on roller skating in the district. Yes. That, oh my gosh, I want to meet <laughs> the roller skating historian of Washington, DC. I have to know, I need to know all about it. And I think, you know, the work that I'm doing here at the cathedral, what you've done with the National Park Service and what DC uh, Public Records is doing, I think really just kind of come together to tell a more complete story of community within the district. Yes, so, yes it, was, so it was It was roller skating with whistles and all the fun. <laughs> back in the day. Big roller skating over at uh, Anacostia. Thank you. So, Director Toppin, you were about to make a statement. So, um, so I would just say that uh, DPR were very intentional about um, our showmobile activities and um, work closely with the mayor's office and, and lots of um, community-based organizations around the district to um, bring the showmobile to the various communities and to, um, to, to as addition to events. Um, but we also do permit the showmobile out. Uh, there is a, um, of course, a, a fee with that, and it is um, fully staffed 
with our with our staff um, and the the seasonal permit window it, it opens up seasonally I should say the permit window opens up seasonally and and so you know if there's any you know request or any um, you know events or activities that you would like us to attend please feel free to reach out and um, and we will try to support in, in every way we can I hope that answered your question <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> great. You know, it's great to hear that because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the importance of these types of activities and getting into the community, they really build, I know I'm using the word community a lot, but it builds a sense of community and a sense of togetherness between, because it crosses all genres, all races, all ages, you know, music does. And so these types of programs are extremely important. Now I saw uh, someone else had their hand up, but then they put it back down before I could go to them. I believe it was Terry who had their hand up. If you still wanted to come back, raise your hand, come back. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I will ask another question because I do have more questions on my sheet, but I don't like to take up all the time. <laughs> so what do you think? And I know we've kind of touched on this already, but what would you say is the lasting legacy of this work? So again, super broad in yeah. putting it in the showmobile, because as we know, DC has its own musical culture very, very strong, whether that's go-go or whatever, it was, it is woven into the community. Um, it, it was especially woven in back then because it was more of a time. We really have to look back in the early seventies where people would be out and you'd be on the porch and you'd have community and you'd set up a little card table and play cards and have the radio going in the background. It really is so woven into the culture and there's so much pride in that culture and that's something that in the research of it that's uh amazing is just the crowds that would come out and it became a regular activity so just like you have the showmobile showing up some showmobiles events you know they're scheduled and they're published where are we going to be on friday night and then you'd have a crowd there or what concerts were going on. So that partnership in the musical universe is like a big warm hug of where you're always welcome. You know your neighbors. It's very peaceful and, and content in the experience of when I was a kid, you'd go to the drive-in and the kids would go play up on the swing sets and the parents would all hang out. And you're probably not even really watching the mu mu movie, but it was the experience of gathering. So basing this, and we did put some ethnomusicology in the, in the report that it was phenomenal because it helped define um, the ownership of DC. And like I said, in the black power experience, the demographics at the time, it was Chocolate City all day. And so music being one of the defining elements was one of a takeaway that's been, and I know people will come in with all kinds of opinions, but it was amazing, you know, just everywhere back then. And so as you see that and where it is now, still there, but it was just, you know, part of the nostalgia of the time and how that follow on in the community. Cause I know parents are out there talking about go-go and going to clubs and showing up at a club at 11 PM. We had an interview with uh, sugar bear who you probably know from uh, EU experience unlimited sort of doing uh, you know, debut is the, is the song um, in a club. And, you know, I'm bringing students in there and it's midnight and we're interviewing on intermission. And one of my best memories is that that club didn't have like Buffalo Wild Wings wings or wing stop. That club had wing wings and there's all ages in there jamming 
at all hours and the students are wide eyed, you know, doing these interviews, living that experience, being in the music. And I think that continues on today in certain avenues, but we might need to recognize that the timing, the time was different. You knew your neighbors, right? You had a sense of culture. So I think you all are still doing that. Showmobile is an amazing vehicle to, to keep doing that, bringing those neighbors together, especially with the demographics change you all have experienced in D the DC population, bringing everybody together. Oh, so, long yeah. answer. I see you have another hand up. <clears throat> Terry, oh, hand. you have your question. You can unmute. Terry, you can unmute it. You would like to ask your question. You're silent. Okay, well, while you unmute, <laughs> I will uh, share that I'm sharing in the chat the uh, wonderful study that you conducted on summer in the parks, which is how I found you. <laughs> I read your study. I thought it was fantastic. And I said that um, it was amazing. Um, it won't let you on here. Hmm. <clears throat> so I've given you the power to unmute. Um, I'm sorry, maybe if you type your question in the chat, we can answer it that way. <clears throat> and I'm sorry that you can't unmute. Um, but yeah, so I put a, cop, a link to the publication in the chat. Recommend everyone read it because it is great. And I was very fascinated by it. And so that's actually what inspired this conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so uh, are there any other questions while we wait for Terry's question in the chat? Oops, oops. <laughs> I will say that, you know, I love having these conversations. This is, I like this format of conversations with people because, you know, sometimes you have these programs and they're just a presentation and everyone just sits there and watches. It's just boring and stale. Slides. I think there's slides. Yeah, slides, slides. Yeah, and, right. yeah, it's just kind of glaze over. I think that, you know, these types of conversations open up to learn more and you get to really learn about the project in a relaxed environment. So I thank you for being willing to participate in this type of format. And I know there are more programs coming throughout the month of February throughout the uh, Mayor's Office of African American Affairs celebrating Black History Month. So check out their X page, check out the Office of the Secretary's page, follow us at DC State Archive on X. We're calling it State Archives because we're preparing for DC statehood. <laughs> so, not sure if Terry's question is there. Um, Secretary Bassett, do you have some closing remarks for us? If not, I mean, again, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Thank you, um, Dr. Garland Jackson. Thank you, Chief of Staff Toppin, um, and all of the D um, DC. Parks and Rec employees that are on. I see quite a few of my friends. So hi to you and thank you so much. Yes, thank you for uh, your work and thank you for coming. As you heard today, their work is very important and <laughs> leaves long lasting effects on the citizens of DC. So and I want to thank you all as well. Thank you, um, Madam Secretary. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lopez. Dr. And and Dr. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, and, <laughs> Dr. Matthews and Dr. Uh, Garland Jackson. This has uh, been really fascinating. I, I just love your uh, knowledge of this, of the district and, and of Showmobile. I, I learned some things and I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Terry, if you still have your question, please email me at lopez.matthews at dc.gov and I will get an answer to your question. So I'm so sorry about your technical issue, but we will answer your question if you email it to me. So I'll type it in the chat as well. And thank you so much for having me. It's been delightful. When life is so hard, I want to go back to those good times of, of doing interviews and, and all of those things. So 
I love what you do and continue it on. And if you ever need me, especially in the space of primary prevention and takeaways, I'd happily support. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our lunch and learn conversation and have a great day and enjoy your holiday weekend. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Yeah.